It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dustin Coles and his little brother Tyler Coles, um, who are just completely tearing it up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, you guys have oh, been here about, what, 15 years? Yeah, right. And you're already at seven locations. And um, I, I wanted to get the two premier Arizona orthodontists on here because, um, hell, that's even their name, uh, premier orthodontics, because, um, you know, the big controversies in dentistry when I got out of school was HMOs, it was capitation. Now it's DSOs. And in your space, it's Invisalign and Smiles Direct Club and... And, um, but you guys have really been entrepreneurs. So tell us about your journey. You guys both grew up in Utah and then you went to dental school at Creighton. Both yeah, of you yeah, went to Creighton yeah. and I went to Creighton, um, undergrad. Um, and then I um, went to um, Missouri for dental school and then you guys became orthodontists at, uh, Indiana. Indiana. And how about you? The same. Both Indiana. Yeah. So yeah, you're both Hoosiers and they, um, and they just figured out what a Hoosier meant. Did you? Hear that on NPR? No, they said no. Well, when they used to, the true story, when they used to lay railroads, they would lay like five miles a day. So when you're laying railroads to a town, it wouldn't make sense to everybody introduce first name, Joe. So they always say um, who they worked for. And sure enough, the lady um, doing a railroad history book, a man named Hoosier laid a railroad clear across Indiana. So it would have been the norm if someone said, hey, who are you? I'm one of Hoosier's boys. And so that's what, that's what I, it, and, and, and all the historians said, yeah, that's it. It's, that's definitive. That's no more joke. But, uh, so then, so, you, so then what made you, um, gosh, Utah, Creighton in Nebraska, Indiana, what made you come here and tell us about your journey? Yeah, for me, um, I, I was the first one to come. I, my wife is from Hawaii. And so we met in Utah, went to Nebraska, then Indiana. And she said, I'm down with the winter. So yeah. she gave me a few few places to go, and Arizona was one of them. So. Was Hawaii one of them? Did she want to go there? I was, but I didn't really want to go to Hawaii. So. And wh why was that? Was it island fever? or Island what? fever, competition. Um, it's it's a tough go over there. It's, it's expensive to live and to own a practice. So. Yeah, people don't realize, I mean, just a box of Ritz crackers has to get on a boat from L.A. and fly. And exactly. Chevy. I mean, it is incredibly yeah. high overhead infrastructure. And so what year did you open up in Arizona? So I started in 2006. 2006. Well, I, I should uh, be professional and read their intros. So Dustin Coles here is the founder of Premier Orthodontics, the largest and fastest growing private practice orthodontics specialty office in Arizona. He is passionate about excellent orthodontic treatment and was voted as the top Invisalign orthodontist in North America at the Invisalign case shootout. Since founding Premier Orthodontics in 2006, his practice has transformed over 15,000 patients in Arizona. He has over 14 years of practice management and ownership experience, managing six doctors and over 50 staff members in seven locations. Dr. Coles also teaches at the Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health Graduate Orthodontic Program. In 2016, Dr. Dustin and Tyler Coles were honored to receive the Genie Award from the Smile Changes Lives Foundation for their commitment to donate over $600,000 worth of orthodontic treatment to underprivileged children living in Arizona. <coughs> Dr. Dustin Coles completed his undergraduate studies at Brigham Young University, went on to receive his DDS with distinction from Creighton University School of Dentistry, graduating with the highest academic standing in his class. Dr. Coles then completed a certificate of advanced graduate study in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics at the Indiana University School of Dentistry in 2006. Now you're 41 and this is your 35 year old brother. So my, that's the same difference between my oldest Eric and my youngest Zach. So uh, you'd be my Zach. So Dr. Tyler Coles is a speaker, teacher, marketer, and orthodontic specialist. Since joining his brother's practice in 2012, he has helped grow their practice from two to seven locations in just under six years. That is so amazing. In 2016, Dr. Coles co-founded Ortho Marketing DFY for, and DFY is um, done for done you, for yep. done for you, a marketing agency that provides done for you marketing services for orthodontics. Ortho Marketing DFY now implements the same marketing strategies that Dr. Coles used in his own practice into the practice of a hundred orthodontic clients throughout the U.S. and Canada. These marketing strategies have helped generate over $150 million in revenue for his orthodontic clients and in his own practice. Dr. Kyler to Coles is the only orthodontist in the world that is also an Infusion Soft certified provider. Dr. Tyler Coles has been invited to speak throughout the country. 
and has shared the stage with experts in orthodontic industry as well as world-renowned marketers. Dr. Tyler Coles continues to practice orthodontics in his own private practice where he and his brother donate over $600,000 of free orthodontic care each year to children in Phoenix. $600,000 each year? Yeah, so about 100 kids each year. <coughs> 100 kids, and how do you pick those 100 kids? So they're identified by Smiles Change Lives. They have a system where they you know, base it on income and household size and things like that. Smiles Change Lives. Is that out of Kansas City? Is that Dustin's? Um, he's a part of it, but it's it's their own foundation. It's their own foundation. So we actually, where are they at? They're in Kansas City. Can but, you can you text me that? Oh, that's right. Smiles. Can you text me the link, um, Buster? SmilesChangeLives.org? .org. Uh -huh. dot org. And where, did, where does that come from? Where, where does committing to 100 children? So when we first signed up with them, we found out there's 20 kids on the wait list, and most of them have been on there almost like five years because there just weren't enough providers. So the first year we signed up, we just said, let's take them all and clear off the list. And we've got a lot of practices, a lot of you know, openings, so we decided we wanted to go bigger and make it a big deal. So we actually decided to do 100 kids, and there weren't enough kids in Phoenix to fill that list, so we partnered with you know, news organizations to try to get the word out. So we just decided if we're going to do it, we might as well go big and you know help as many kids as we can. And where does that come from? So I mean, a lot of it is our father. He was always very generous with dentistry. He was always bartering either you know horse riding lessons for dentistry or house painting for dentistry. So we always saw that growing up where he was able to help people who couldn't otherwise afford it by being creative. So we really want to do the same thing in our practice. And you know, this is also. It was giving us a lot of opportunities to be on the media, to be on the news, and we don't feel like giving away treatment like hurts your practice. We feel it actually grows your practice. Yeah. So the more you give, the more you are charitable, the more you get in return. And these kids usually turn into your best referral sources. The parents are your biggest fans. And so rather than doing it once and having nobody know about it, you might as well do it a hundred times and let everybody know about it. That's kind of been our philosophy and our strategy. Yeah, most most guys that. Because there's, there's probably 10 or 12 guys that, that offer the service here in Phoenix. Most of them will treat like one or two cases a year for free. And for us, we're like, if you're going to do one or two, why do it at all? And, and so we just thought, you know, as crazy as it sounds, it actually helps grow our practice. By giving, by giving something away, you know, it, it grows your practice. The media and, and the, you know, like he was saying, uh, people that talk about it and, and it, it helps and not only that, but I mean, we deep, deep in our heart of hearts, we like we like doing it. But it's also you know side effect is it's helped us to grow our, our business. Right? Give us well, the voice. well, you know, most um, orthodontic, you know, Americans, uh, you know, they always they always say one thing and they do another. Um, and you know, what made America great is intense competition. But when DSOs came out, oh, all these American dentists didn't like the DSOs. And it's like, well, that's increased competition. I mean, the consumer, when I got here in 87, I mean, my God, if you broke your teeth on a Saturday or Sunday, you might as well go to a hospital. I mean, you couldn't, but when the DSOs came out, it was early morning, evening, more weekend. Um, the orthodontists had never seen competition the first 10, 20 years I practiced. But now with Invisalign, and General Dentist doing Invisalign, and now we're out here in Arizona, and Invisalign actually opened up their own store in um, Camelback Mall, or, or Scottsdale, Scottsdale, Fashion. Scottsdale Fashion Center. Um, I tried to shop there, but they stopped me in the parking lot and say, you are so unfashionable, <laughs> go back to your car and leave. And I go, they say, go back to Kansas. And now uh, Smiles Direct Club has got, what, three locations? No, four locations? Yeah, four locations four. around Phoenix, yeah. So um, I, I want to talk about that because that's the controversy. You know, if you have media, if it bleeds, it leads. So do you see this as a threat to orthodontics? Do you see it as a plus? I mean, how do you – or is it just is what it is? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, um, you know, I'm on some different Facebook groups, and these orthodontists that are in these groups talk about how – Basically, the sky is falling, and Smile Direct Club is the worst thing that could have ever happened. And how all these patients are, you know, being treated un unfairly or poorly. And I have the exact opposite view of it. And not do I agree with it one hundred percent, but I feel like that a rising tide kind of raises all boats. And whether or not you know we're you know, so orthodontic. Um, I guess people people looking to fix their teeth. The the fact that there's other companies that are talking about 
that are talking about straightening teeth with, with clear aligners, that they have commercials all over the place. I mean, I, I think that, it, that consumer awareness is, is up significantly because of it, and I think it actually helps um, if you can tap into that same kind of market that, that they're driving. I mean, really, really, I think it's, a, it's almost, some, some people talk about it's like, you know, this is, this is when orthodontics goes off the cliff, and I think it's almost like the golden age of orthodontics. People are going to be talking about it, they're aware of it, and it's an opportunity. Well, you know, I noticed that when um, Clear Choice came to Arizona. I mean, Clear Choice, um, we had the uh, founding oral surgeon on the show from um, um, Denver, and uh, my gosh, when they came to Arizona, all the oral surgeons and periodontists were like, oh my God, you know, evil force. And they just started running all these infomercials on TV, and every other day, some lady would be in my office saying, yeah, I was watching that commercial, you know, talking about, and, and it's like, well, the dentists weren't advertising, um, their, their, their nonprofit associations aren't advertising, and I think Clear Choice informed, I mean, Arizona is, like, what, 7 million people? And uh, what, uh, 4 million are in the valley? And I think they totally raised the dental implant IQ of Arizona single-handedly. Yeah, I think yeah. every periodontist oral surgeon is doing they more implants today. Right yeah, and if you look at the implants pay, place uh, per uh, million Americans, um, you know, I love when, when these dental companies are publicly traded, like the, the largest dental implant company in the world is, um, oh, it's not, uh, which one is it? It's Strom. Strom, Stroman. Uh, because they've acquired um, uh, the biggest one out of Brazil, Neodent, they acquired in Israel, um, um, what is it, MIS, make it simple and plan. You know, they've done all these acquisitions, they're publicly traded, and in their 10K annual report, they show how many implants are placed per million people for all the countries. America's like number 30 on the list. <laughs> I, I mean, so the, the room, I mean, that's one of the reasons the stock does so well, because Wall Street looks at it and say, God, if, if Americans got implants at the rate of Koreans, this stock's gonna double or triple or, or you know, I mean, it's got so much upward momentum. And ortho, when I was little, Catholic family, five sisters, a brother, back then all, everybody had a big family. Only the most crowded kid who had no chance of getting married uh, got braces and headgear and all that stuff. And now, uh, with smaller families, it's like orthodontics. I mean, I, I see the, the kids all getting them in high school. And then I see them getting them again at like 30. And sometimes they're getting them again at 50. I mean, it's just, I, I see the upward trend of ortho, I mean, it's just like, it's just like people are gonna have white straight teeth. Yeah, and there's even more people, like if you look at the percentage of people that actually get orthodontic treatment, I mean, it's maybe 5% of the US population. So there's this huge percentage Only of people. Only 5% of Americans get ortho? Yes, it's very small. So are you kidding? If you look at the number of people where there's potentially could get orthodontic treatment, where before they didn't get it because it was you know, five or six thousand dollars. There's this huge market that might pay two or three thousand. That's really what Smile Direct Club is doing is they're tapping into that huge market that no one else is. So again, you can complain about it that they're going after those people that probably wouldn't be your patients anyway, or you can strategically position yourself where you can provide a similar service, maybe at a higher cost, but you know, lower than your normal service or normal fee and capture a percentage of that market because that 95% that wasn't going to buy braces from you anyway now is looking and is interested because Smile Direct cl Clubs raised the awareness. So again, it, it will require us changing our position, changing our strategy and our price points, but I think there's even more opportunity to do it. It will just require change, which you know, most orthodontists and dentists don't like to change, but you know, that's the bottom line is you know, the way it was 10 years ago, it'll never be that way again. So. That's why, you know, we got to figure out the new way to do it and how that's going to look for a private practice orthodontist. So America has 326 million people and only 5% of them got ortho? And that's why... I mean, you should just <laughs> buy Invisalign. Now, now is Smiles Direct, are they doing an IPO? They, they will eventually, they haven't yeah. yet. Yeah. Are they going to? I'm sure they will. Like, does Invisalign still own, or the Align Technology, which owns Invisalign and uh, iTero, do they still own like, like 17%? 17 percent? Yeah, they're, they're, they're in a lawsuit with them. They're not friends anymore, so they'll part ways. So why are they not friends? What's the... They're suing each other over... So when, when Invisalign opened their stores, uh, they said that that was a, that was a breach of the non-compete contract because Smile Direct Club has their scanning centers. 
and so so Invisalign was trying to do something to compete with it, and and Smile Direct didn't like the. So the, the now Invisalign. Look, 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 let's first address our earlier loss here. Aren't they having um, issues with Three Shape out of Copenhagen, Denmark too? I know that they've, the they've stopped accepting scans from from the Three Shape scanner. So I'm, I'm assuming I don't, I don't know the details, but. Well, Invisalign owns iTero. Correct. Yeah. So they're probably. You think it's just they're just trying to. I think they're doing it to try force everybody to go to iTero. Yeah. And have you scanned with iTero and Three Shape? I've only used iTero, but from the, it, from the looks of it, I think Three Shape is like very intuitive and it looks like it's almost better. Yeah. But I've never used one, so I can't. I got I got a theory on why um, um, Three Shape, which is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and what's the other one? Um, uh, in Helsinki, Finland. Um, Oh, what's it's a plan mecca? Yeah, uh, plan mecca. Yeah. Um, because I've uh, lectured in those cities and went to the headquarters, and the the country is frozen like eight months of the year. And th this is what Dennis <laughs> tell me. I, 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 you can't make this stuff up. They say in the winter, when it's like dark and frozen, you're either gonna work like ten hours a day, six days a week, or you're just gonna like sit in your basement and drink. And um, <laughs> I think they're the hardest working people in the world, Scandinavia, because I mean, um, you know, you just uh, the winter's so brutal. I mean, it's not like you're tempted. Like I remember when I got my issue at MBA um, at um, at Arizona State University. When I was at Creighton, so many times I had the worst motives in my mind. You know, not wanting to study. And I, me and Gary Asaldi and Randy Kern, we'd look out the window and it's frozen, it's sleet, there's snow, and you're like. Well, we might as well just stay in and study. <laughs> and then I go to ASU and it's like perfect weather and there's all these people skateboarding. And I thought, man, if I went to ASU, I would have flunked out. <laughs> I think every college university should be in Antarctica. <laughs> and I just send the kids there. They're completely frozen. They have no options. So the Invisalign is probably, um, uh, Line Technology is probably, doesn't want to embrace three shape to protect their iTero. So, and um, Smiles Direct Club. Um, well, let, let, let's talk about... Um, Smiles Direct Club, because if you go in, um, if I go to Arizona, Smiles Direct Club, uh, near me, um, my gosh, um, they have several locations just in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So what are they doing at a Smiles Direct Club? They're just scanning? Do they have an orthodontist there? Is there doctor oversight? So we actually sure. secret shopped it. We sent our manager in to get treatment, so... Um, they went to the one in Mesa, but you know they scheduled online on the website. They were able to schedule their appointment online. He showed up. There was just two dental assistants sitting there. There's no doctor on site. With one scanner. And all they did was like they did a scan of his teeth, with, showed him his with, with, what, with what scan with Ontario. Okay. Ontario. Then they showed him the the scan. They're like, all right, here's your two treatment options. Which one do you want? Painful or financing? So it was one was one it. clinical treatment plan, but two financial arrangements. Yep. And what was what was the price? It was twenty four ninety seven for pay in full or no, I think it was twenty two ninety seven if you pay in full, twenty four ninety seven if you finance payments. And what were the so twenty two ninety nine pay in full? Yeah. And twenty four ninety nine if it was, was financed. Two hundred down, eighty dollars a month. Two hundred dollars down, eighty a month. Now I want to. Now I don't think you guys are old enough to remember Orthodontic Centers of America. I was right at the tail end of it when it kind of collapsed. And what year was that? Two thousand and six, two thousand five. Because the one, the the lesson takeaway, and that that's what's so great about being fifty six and having grandchildren. Besides just the uh, diabetes and all the other uh, things, <laughs> is the um, the fact that you keep seeing these rodeos over. You know, you recognize pattern. Like I graduated in eighty, and um, the prime rate from the Federal Reserve was twenty point five. Double digit unemployment. So when people talk about a bad economy, they don't even know what a bad economy was. <laughs> the interest rate on my first home mortgage was 14%. And now that interest rates are going from two to three, everybody's freaking out. It's like, you know, they, they haven't even been around the block. And then I graduated school May of 87, and October was Black Monday, where the market fell 25% a day. And then there was the Y2K bubble that part in March 2000. Then there was Lehman Brothers in um, August 15, 2008. Um, so I've seen all these rodeos, and, and we're, it smells just like that again. I mean, we're, it's been 10 years since the last correction. We're totally in you know, the, whole, the whole thing. And it's no big deal because 
you survive, I survived the last four after a year or two, <laughs> and you'll survive this one. And the reason there's a business cycle is because the people making all the decisions are humans, and they make a lot of bad decisions. So about every 8, 10, 12 years, uh, the market has to correct for all this malfeasance, um, investment, and all these bad, irrational decisions. But what I liked about it, but I saw orthodontic centers of America, I lived through that, the beginning and the end. And um, it was, um, um, what was his name out of? Uh, Gas Gaspar, Gaspar Lazarus. Lazarus. Good old boy. And, um, but the genius part of the lesson was lost. He didn't understand why people financed ortho. Because if I'm GM and I make you a car, I have to buy 30,000 parts. I have to buy them. They just assemble cars. They don't make cars. They assemble them. So when I sell you this car, I need my money to pay my suppliers. But he looked at ortho as like getting a Manny Petty. Imagine going to get a Manny Petty. And I'm sure you guys get your nails and nails done <laughs> every week. What would you do if the lady said, um, okay, to get your nails done, um, you're going to get them done once a month for two years. And the cost of uh, once a month, say it's $100 for 24 months, it's $2,400. I need $1,000 down and I'll finance the other 1,400 at 10%. It's like, well, you're, you're selling a service. You don't, you don't need cost. Why, why are you financing a cost you don't even have? And Lazarus and Orthodox Center said, zero dollars down, zero percent interest. Nobody will be denied. And you give us, a, it's a hundred, it was, a, I think it was, a, what was it? $299 a month for 24 months. And he only, and once you bracketed up all these people, he only had 1% leave and never come back. And so that, that $0 down, 0% interest, nobody's credit denied, made braces affordable. And he was the only DSO who made it to the New York Stock Exchange, publicly traded on the NYSE. No one else, no DSO has ever done it again. And um, it, was, it was just amazing. Now, it fell apart because he couldn't get all the orthodontists to be his employees. Yeah. They're too yeah. highly educated to stand in line. Uh, a DSO is like herding cats. And if you want to have a million employees, you should go into the military or Walmart, but not. I mean, to have a 10,000 orthodontists taking your orders, that, that's never going to happen. They're, they're too educated yeah. to take orders. Um, but, but it was all the financing package. So in this twenty four ninety nine, not only is he making it affordable, but I mean, um, you know, it's just uh, it, it's it's all in the financing. Mm -hmm. So so this Smiles Drug Club, they scan it with an Itero, then where do they send it? Do they send it to Invisalign? I think they do most of their aligners on their own now. They have they have a so yeah. Previously, Invisalign made the aligners for them, but I believe they're trying to distance themselves from Invisalign, and they're doing their own manufacturing. I believe manufacturing of clear aligners. Yeah. Now, some orthodontists, I'm, I, um, I'm not allowed to go on Orthotown because you have to be an orthodontist to go on that. Even though I own Orthotown, <laughs> every gym. time I've ever posted in like the last 10 years, someone said, uh, uh, excuse me, but you're not an orthodontist. This or the, they won't even let their suppliers, which I think is really sad on Orthotown because, you know, the, the, the dental orthodontic manufacturers, they always come to me and ask me, well, what are the orthodontists? And it's like, there's, what do they think about this, that? And it's like all this threads, but the orthodontists won't let them come on ortho. And I, I fought this, I thought this was dental town in the beginning. And all these dentists <laughs> were emailing me back in 98 saying, you know, this guy's on, on dental town and he works for Shine. And I'm like, and, and your question is, well, he, he's just trying to sell something. I'm like, oh, so you're a volunteer? What are you working in public health? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you don't sell thousand dollar grant? Why? How come when you sell something, you're the Virgin Mary, and then when someone else sells something, you're Satan? I mean, well, how, how does that, how that? Where does that come from? But I, on Dental Town, I made it so I, I, if all the dentists were saying this composite was too thick, well, it's not going to get fixed unless all the people that make composites are reading this. Yeah. And all you dental manufacturers looking at this, a lot of dentists will, a lot of manufacturers say, well, what do the dentists think about this or that? Dude, I'll do a search on Dental Town. There's five and a half million posts and I'll search your company's product and you could read for two hours of what all the dentists are saying about it. Um, so uh, it's crazy, but uh, so, um, gosh, I'm on so many tangents over, I don't <laughs> even know. Uh, but a lot of the orthodontists, um, they don't like Invisalign because it's competition. And they don't like competition, which I don't know why they don't leave America. America was just based on capitalism and competition. But I say, well, if you don't like them, why are you still doing it? And they say, well, the clear tray aligner 
really is a different beast that um, um, Invisalign has so much technology in their plastics and their acrylics making their liners that are really that you can't really say all clear liner trades are the same. Do you believe that or not believe that? Yeah, I think that Invisalign is. I mean, I've never I've used a couple of other companies, but the technology and the process is so refined in Invisalign. I think it makes it really hard to use something different. Nothing really compares with it as far as. Um, in, in my opinion. Now, what about the brand? When I got out of school in 87, all the national brands were already made. Um, you know, everybody knew what Colgate was and Listerine and all that stuff. But Invisalign is the only hot new brand. When people come to you and they say they want Invisalign, is it easy to switch them to a clear liner or do they really want brand specific? Like, I want the Gucci Invisalign. <laughs> I don't want this knockoff Michael Core. Um, is it like that or not really? Uh, I I think that Invisalign has almost become like, like, like chapstick is you know like lip balm. You know, we call it all chapstick or, or like tissues is called a Kleenex. I think I think Invisalign is just kind of it's it's so well known now that even patients will come in and ask for an Invisalign retainer. We make clear retainers for patients when they're done with braces, and so Invisalign has become that. If you give them something clear that's plastic, it's Invisalign. I, I don't think there's anything, I think they've lost some of their proprietary like, effectiveness because of how much... Well, they, they'll, they'll, they'll have to defend <laughs> that because when people start saying, go make a Xerox copy of this, and it was a Canon printer, Xerox loses their, their right because it becomes a burp. Yeah. And yeah. Kleenex lost their deal because people would say, hand me a Kleenex. In fact, when you travel around the world, there's like 238 countries... And in the majority of countries, there's no word for toothpaste, it's just Colgate. So mom will say, put Colgate on that, and you might be using one of a thousand different types of toothpaste made, which, it'll blow your mind. I was in Philadelphia one time, lecturing this dentist, said, you gotta see this. And it was a generic toothpaste manufacturer, so they had tubes, and they were making, I mean, just this machine was making tubes of toothpaste so fast, you could barely even see them with all these different labels. He was private, original manufacturer, for like a thousand brands from Brazil to Jordan. I mean, it was just amazing. <laughs> uh, but the word is, is toothpaste for most countries. I mean, the it's word Colgate. for toothpaste is Colgate. Um, but you think it's um, it's headed that way for Invisalign, where people just associate clear liners as Invisalign? I, I, think, I think so. so. Yeah. And what what percent? What, what year did you get out of ortho school? Oh six. Oh six. So in two thousand six, when did Invisalign really start? It's <laughs> probably. Ten years prior to me, I can't remember. I think it's ninety, maybe it's like ninety-eight or ninety-nine, maybe eight years. And in in two thousand six versus today, two thousand, uh, hell, it's two thousand nineteen. I mean, we're only Basically. two yeah. weeks from two thousand nineteen. Um, in from two thousand six, what percent of the ortho market was clear aligners, and what has it grown to now in two thousand nineteen? Do you know the number? I can't remember the exact numbers, but. It's still I, pretty small. I think they're I think they're less than ten percent of of orthodontics. Maybe it's even less than that. It might be like five percent. Uh, Back then, I think they had I think they had yeah, less like than point oh five yeah, percent. Less than five percent <laughs> in two thousand six. So, 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 so only five percent of the three hundred twenty six million Americans are getting ortho, and of those, only five percent are getting Invisalign. Yeah, it's small. So is that a stock you feel like you could just buy and own it for 20 years? I think so, yeah. I mean, is yeah. that a Warren Buffett buy and hold deal? I mean... Especially now. The stock right now the stock's down. plummeted, it's so... You're going to buy it by now. Like, well, buy all, the, all the stocks are All down. the tech stocks yeah. are down. Facebook so. is down now. It's down, it's down 25% over the last two months. And I think it's more just a market-directed thing rather than an Invisalign-directed thing. But Invisalign it was stock. At, I think it was at 290 was it its peak and now it's at two twenty or something? So we'll go. Um, we'll go. Max. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's spiked there, and I've got some, so I've been watching it closely. So. <laughs> so you. Um, so basically, <clears throat> I still think the market is. Yeah, they're just barely penetrating Asia and South America. And that's the other thing. Yeah, they're just starting in these huge markets. So I lecture, I, whenever I um, lecture, uh, you know, my boys won't go to me, go with me to lecture in, you know, Cincinnati, Ohio, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, but whenever I leave the country, usually three out of four will go with me. 
last time we were lecturing in Cambodia, Malaysia, um, every, everybody wanted, any, anytime you were at a restaurant and someone found out you were a dentist, they just went right to Invisalign. And it was just amazing. Uh, even uh, South Africa, we were in Tanzania, South Africa, and Namibia, and um, every single girl that found out we were den in, in dentistry went straight to Invisalign. But the weirdest thing that was just um, amazing was, I'll never forget in Malaysia, this beautiful waitress, just completely gorgeous, had Invisalign. And in there, it was 1200 US dollars. And her annual, her income for the year would be 4,000 US. And she spent a quarter, <laughs> quarter for of her yearly <laughs> income on Invisalign. And I'm positive that 100% of all the boys in Asia would have said she was a, you know, she was perfectly fine, beautiful and gorgeous. And I asked her, why would she spend a quarter of her year's income? And she was telling me about every little thing wrong with it. And I thought, wow, what a, what a market. <laughs> Be because it's completely insanity. I mean, uh, you, know, um, you know, that people would just pay a quarter of their year's income because their lateral incisor was crooked and this and that. And um, so another big controversy on this line, um, some Invisalign providers say, and do any case. And, and some old school are not saying, no, it's not for for by extraction or it's not for some of these uh, other cases. What percent of the cases um, do you think they can do? So in our practice, we have a, a tagline is um, you can have Invisalign guaranteed. <laughs> so basically 100% of, well, I'd say there's probably 95% that we'll, we'll recommend it on. Not recommend it, but we'll just we'll ask the patient, "What do you want?" And as long as they don't have an impacted canine, that's kind of like my limit, my my limitation. Um, impacted canine, like, are a super deep bite. Other than that, um, we'll treat almost anybody with Invisalign. So, what percent of your practice? You have seven practices. Uh -huh. What percent of your cases uh, this year will be Invisalign versus uh, uh, fixed wire? It's about thirty percent. Thirty percent. And what would you say the average is for the ortho the average orthodontist in the United States? Probably less than five percent. Less than five percent. Yeah. And what percent of the ortho market in the United States is done by general dentists versus orthodontists? I don't even know. I know the majority of Invisalign is done by orthodontists still. By far, we're still providing most of the Invisalign treatment, even though every general dentist is an orthodontic or Invisalign provider. By far, like the majority of Invisalign treatment is done by orthodontists. And, and why, why do you think that is? I, I, I have been, I've been preaching on my show for a thousand episodes that I'm convinced that if you don't do the procedure at least once a week, you never get fast enough and efficient enough to be profitable. So like these dentists will spend all this time and money on the implants and they'll go buy a CBCT and I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll get a quarter million into the hole and then they place an implant every three months. And then you go next door to the periodontist that's in the same building and he's placing two a day. And um, same, same, so I, I always tell dentists, if you can't get to one a week, you're not going to make a return on investment of your money. And so when you know it's a procedure where the dentist is driving to work and thinking, oh my God, I got a Invisalign case, I need to go in early. Do you ever have to go in early if you have a, an Invisalign case <laughs> to cram for your appointment? No. When's the last time you had to, where you had a knot in your stomach? Or you wanted to get to work early to cram uh, for a procedure, a no, patient. Uh, it's been like 12 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so when you have that knot in your stomach where you're like, oh my God, I got a sleep apnea case, I got an Invisalign case, I'm going to place an implant, I'm going to do this. And then furthermore, you know, my two older sisters are nuns and my oldest sister is probably the smartest person I know. She's read every major religion. She said the only thing that's in every major religion is the golden rule. There's not a name of a person, place, thing, city that shows up in Hinduism, um, the Quran, the Bible, all these different things. And it's true that people like you want to be treated. I mean, I've only had one surgery, a vasectomy. I wouldn't want to go to some guy who does a vasectomy every three months. You know, I would want to go to a guy that could do it. Uh, Stevie Wonder style, you know, blindfolded. <laughs> so, you know, would, if you needed an implant, would you really want you to do it? And then as far as making money on it, you know how much more profitable it is in Phoenix if you're going to place five implants a month to have some periodontist from Tucson or from Flagstaff drive into your office one Friday, half day, 
a month and place your five implants and split the fee with them 50 50 now you don't have to have all the infrastructure overhead i mean if you're just making money on the deal um you know if you're not doing one a week so so these general dentists do you, do you think the general dentist what percent of the general dentists doing ortho do you think don't even make money on it I'd net say, income profit dollars. I, unless they're using it as a loss leader like most of them don't make very little so I mean, some guys will do Invisalign for the purpose of acquiring a patient. They just break even on the Invisalign. It's a bait switch more than a moneymaker. I, I would say it's less than 10% that actually make money. Yeah. From the the big part is just the lab fee. Like, Invisalign gives quantity discounts. If you're doing one case a month, you're paying $1,800 for a lab fee. You know, our, our lab fee is closer to $1,000. So Because of the volume discounts? Yeah, so just the profit margin is not there if you're not doing enough of it. Because your upfront lab fee is eighteen hundred, how much can you charge and still turn a profit if you're taking time away from doing your cleanings, exams, crowns, and everything else that actually makes you money? Yeah. So um, again, if it's a bait and switch, I think they might turn a profit, but otherwise, I don't know that. Unless you're doing it like an orthodontist, where you have an entire day with just ortho adjustments, if you're trying to fit it in between a crown and a filling and a you know a cleaning, then I don't know that it's efficient or profitable. Now, if you guys went from one location in 2006, right, mm -hmm. to seven locations now, and where were they at? Gilbert, Mesa, Chandler? So, uh, Maricopa, Casa Grande, Chandler. Maricopa. Maricopa, Casa Grande. Casa Grande, Chandler, and then uh, Central Phoenix. Central Phoenix. There's four in Phoenix. That are four in Phoenix. So the largest city in Arizona is Phoenix. Number two is Tucson. Three is Mesa. Four is Chandler. Uh, five is Gilbert. And I kid you not, six is Dentaltown. Dentaltown would be... <laughs> it does. It has 250,000 members. So we're the actually the uh, sixth largest city in Arizona. Um, so you have four in Phoenix. You haven't gone down to Tucson yet. No. Um, and you have how many in Maricopa? Just one. One. How many in Costa One. One in Chandler? One. One. And where will your next one be? Probably Tempe. Tempe? Tempe Mesa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tempe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Tucson. Um, but you couldn't, you couldn't grow this. I mean, if someone said, what is the core competency to grow from one to seven location? It isn't going to be the understanding of Ceph tracings and Invisaligns <laughs> and attracting and finding office manager. It could only be marketing. It could only be how do you feed this growth? And you started, um, you know, we said at the beginning of the show, you started Ortho Marketing DFY, done for you. Ortho Marketing DFY. Tell us about your journey of Ortho Marketing DFY. And you said that you do this for 100 orthodontists in the United States and Canada? Yeah, so... You do it for general dentists? Uh, we have a handful, like... Our systems no, are... No, you mean your general dentists are a handful. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, when I first joined my brother's practice in 2006, or sorry, 2012, there wasn't really enough work for the two of us, so I was working like one day a week for him and then four days in corporate dental offices. And so I didn't love working for them, so I was really motivated to try to figure out how to grow our practice so I could quit the corporate jobs and just work with my brother full time. And so we started attending a lot of marketing seminars. I started researching on how to do all this stuff. And then over the course of figuring it out, implementing it, we started growing our practice. I was able to quit my corporate jobs. And we were going to a lot of coaching, consulting meetings. Another you know, orthodontist saw that we were growing, asked who was doing our marketing. I just told him I was doing it. So on the flight home from one of these meetings, Dustin said, you know, you've already figured out how to do this for us. Maybe we should just do it for other people as well. So... We started it kind of just like a side project where we were just taking a handful of clients and helping them, but we quickly found out there's a huge need for it. And so over the last two years, we went from one to 25 full-time employees doing marketing. Holy moly. <laughs> and, and, how, and how long of a time? A little years. over two years. In two years, you went from one to 25 people? Yeah. Holy moly. So it's very evident that you know, orthodontics is changing that in order to grow your practice and compete with the Smile Direct Clubs and Invisaligns and the DSOs, I mean, you have to market. You can't just sit back and hope that things are going to change. And so that's really been our thing is being proactive, going to get your own patients, going direct to consumer, and then you're able to acquire patients. So most 
orthodontists aren't you know expert marketers. They don't learn how to do it in school. And it, it, it's, it's, wor it's worse than that. Not only are they not marketers, they're, since they're a doctor. <laughs> I think it's beneath them. They think they know everything. Yeah. I mean, they, once you tell someone they're a doctor of law, doc, I mean, look, look at Congress. It's all lawyers. And they just sit up there so pugnacious that you know, oh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a congressman, I'm the smartest guy on earth. No, you're actually dumber than a rock. <laughs> so, so middle class people, they're the first people to say, I'm going to call a plumber because I don't know how to fix the toilet. I'm going to call, I'm going to take my car into the mechanic because my engine light came on. I'm not a mechanic. A dentist's like, hell, I'm a plumber, mechanic, marketer. <laughs> I'm a doctor, damn it. <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah. So that, so direct to consumer, I want to talk there. So when I get out of school, all your specialists got all their patients from dentists. And then the, the first ones that jump are the pediatric dentists. They realize, well, if I wait for the general dentist, they're just going to wait till this kid's five or six. And then they're going to, and then he's already had a bad experience. Now he's afraid of the dentist. So they, they bypassed the general dentist and went right to the pediatrician's. And focused all on the pediatricians, started getting these kids in at two or three, and they they just don't even really want referrals from general dentists. They so when I got out of school, the orthodontists got all their cases from general dentists. Mm -hmm. But what what percent have you seen that switch from two thousand six when you started to two thousand nineteen? Uh, what percent were from general dentist referrals to now getting them from direct consumer? So yeah, back in the day, we were like eighty ninety percent from dentists. That's all the marketing that I did. I, I, I had kind of a, a mentor when I first came out, and that's what that's all he knew how to do was to go to the dentists and you know muffin runs and lunches and all that kind of stuff. Muffin and, runs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's 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 you know just just go and kiss butt to the dentist and and um, as things have kind of changed over the years, we're probably like twenty percent from referrals now, and eighty percent all other sources, be it you know external marketing, Google, Facebook. Um, and we have a, a ton of patient referrals, and so that's kind of we've we flipped the the referral game. Yeah, we, so we so almost we, refer more patients yeah, to dentists now than we, we receive. Refer more patients because we, we, wow. we don't have, they don't have a dentist when they come to us because of how we attract them. So are they are they running muffins? Do you know they should? <laughs> I actually got a Christmas gift from a dentist. That's like the first time ever this year. This year, yeah, and what was the gift? Uh, I don't know. It was a pancake mix or something that wasn't super exciting but I've sent him 20 patients the last two months holy moly <laughs> you should have got his firstborn child <laughs> and uh, my gosh that is amazing so so let's um so is it all is all your marketing digital virtual or are you doing any print billboard radio TV uh, we do a lot of direct mail so really so we do postcards things like that through the mail we also are on the radio so we have a big footprint in Phoenix so we can advertise and hit all the radio stations. And we just started dabbling with TV recently, so um, we're still trying to figure I out. I tried to do out. an ad for TV for my practice. They told me how to face for radio. <laughs> and so, dude, you can't. You can't really but I, I want to tell you something. Um, when you're 56 and got an MBA and been doing this 30 years, I can smell baloney. Your biases is everything. So since these young millennials spend all their time on Facebook and Yelp and all that, they just believe that's that's the deal. But anybody that I talk to that can show me data and tracking, direct mail is still a kingpin. I mean, they'll even tell you, hell, a 1%, if I mail to 100 homes and get an Invisalign patient, do the math, direct mail, um, so many millennials... If you told them to do direct mail or a postcard, they'd think, oh, this guy's senile. He's <laughs> probably on Viagra and Cialis and <laughs> some uh, dementia medication. But direct mail was the first thing out of your mouth. Yeah. And, and they're going to think it's Facebook because they're on Facebook four hours a day. <laughs> so they said, well, it has to be Facebook. Yeah. But where would you put your money? Direct mail or Facebook? Uh, both. <laughs> so, I mean, we literally can purchase a list, a mailing list. And I can upload that same list into Facebook. And I'll advertise okay. it to them on Facebook and then mail to them at the same time. Okay, so but, but, same but when, they, when they're doing Facebook, they just have their office Facebook page. Yeah. And yeah. they're just posting a meme. They're not uploading. Um, yeah, you, have to, the, you can upload a list and then run ads specifically to that list. And that's the same postcard. Now, what is, that, what is that called when you upload the list? So you can make a custom audience inside of Facebook. So if you can get names, phone numbers, or emails, Facebook knows all of that about everybody. And so if you can get a list of phone numbers and upload that into Facebook, it'll match them to their profile. 
You could say run ads to these people. I think it's so fun to talk about how times change. When I was in college and high school and all that stuff, everybody feared the government. And it was the George Orwell and they were going to spy <laughs> on you. Turns out it wasn't the government at all. It was free enterprise. Now they have Alexa and Amazon and Facebook and Google search. And they're giving them all the private data that they were afraid the government was going to get on. <laughs> freely given and now they just freely give it away for free. And it, it, people are just batshit. I'm convinced at 56 years old that I'm the only normal person living <laughs> in America. I mean, uh, well, it's crazy. I mean, we purchased a list of 27,000 people just last week. And I uploaded it into Facebook and it matched 88% of them. It already knew 88% was. So that 27,000, 88% matched them. So now I can run ads. Now that 27,000, let's talk about that. Was that just for like one of these cities? Was that like everybody in America? So that was around each office. I did a radius of like five miles. And I said, I want everybody that earned $60,000 or more income that has kids in the home and that's a homeowner within five miles of these offices. Okay, 60,000 or now is that combined average household income? Yes, or is that the household individual income. working there? So it was household income. Yeah. So sixty thousand or more has kids and homeowners because we want them to be staying there for two years of braces. Oh, nice homeowners and has kids and why kids is is ortho still more a kids thing than an adult thing? Uh, probably eighty percent of our practice is still kids. And what is the de uh, definition of a kid? What would what seven to age? seventeen? So seven to seventeen and. Sorry to sidetrack and jump around, but are kids compliant with removable retainers? I mean, wouldn't you rather go in there? If some boy comes in... What's funny is uh, I think they're more compliant than some of the adults. <laughs> and is that peer pressure because they want that cosmetic advantage? I think sometimes they want it. They, they don't want braces. And then their parents also are on them. The, you know, the best ones are the homeschoolers. They wear it 100%. Really? Yeah. And is homeschooling getting bigger in the United States? I, I don't know. In, in Arizona, I think it's pretty, you know, I think it's pretty, I don't think it's growing a ton, but. Yeah. What percent of the kids are homeschooled out here, do you think? I'd say it's still probably 5% or less. 5% or less? Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so that, so you did, what is it called when you uh, do a direct mail and then you load the address in and then you. Tag yeah, them. so you purchase a list and then you just upload that list into Facebook as a custom audience. And then once you have that audience inside of Facebook, I can run ads to those people anytime I want. They're now in there. I, I can't so, see their names inside of Facebook, but I can say run this ad to these people and spend as much money as I want on those people. So if we're going to do a campaign and for New Year's, I'm going to run an ad about a New Year's special to these people. And then seven days later, the postcard shows up with the exact same special that they've been seeing on Facebook. So that's the multi-touch marketing where you can show up multi-times and multiple times on Facebook. They get the postcard, and then if they show up on the, the landing page we make, we can then follow them around with banner ads as well. So then you kind of are ever-present in multi-channels. So. so when you, you say Facebook, Facebook is going down and Instagram is exploding. Um, when you say Facebook, are you also talking Yeah, Facebook Instagram? owns Instagram. Right. And so when you use the Facebook ads platform, you run the exact same ad on Facebook and Instagram to those same people. So when I upload that list into Facebook, I follow them around on Instagram or Facebook, wherever they happen to be. And we're in, in, is it young kids on Instagram and their old parents on Facebook? Uh, moms are still on Facebook for the most part. Teenagers are on Instagram, so your buyers are still in Facebook for. So you don't really care about the kids on Instagram or Snapchat because they're not going to write you a check for orthodontics. Yeah, like young twenty-year-olds looking for Invisalign, they're probably more on Instagram. But again, the Facebook ads platform is the same platform for Instagram. So. It was it was considered the number one acquisition on Wall Street. In the last yeah, and anyone big years. enough, one Facebook billion will dollars just, is all he paid for that. Yeah, I mean, Facebook owns everyone's data. That's where the power is. So if there's ever a social media platform that gets big enough, Facebook will just buy them and acquire them. So. I want to step into the other side. Um, um, Martin Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, his dad, Ad, is a dentist. Did yeah. you know that? Mm -hmm. Have you met him? Or, I, we've had him on the show three times. He sat in that chair right there. <laughs> um, you see all these this backlash and all this, you know, about uh, all the data or, you know, this, that. But I don't really see a decrease in users. So do you think it's just monkeys 
screaming and throwing bananas, but they're all going to stay on that platform? Or do you think it's, it could have a material backlash? I think they're so big that they can't really fail at this point. Too big to fail. Because that's where everybody is. And even if, again, they switch platforms, Facebook will just acquire those platforms. Yeah. And as long as they own all the data, that's where all the money is for the advertisers. And so the money is going to follow the data and Facebook will be able to... So let's, so let's, let's coach your competition since I know all the general dentists in Maricopa. You got Tim Taylor down there. You got Jared Pope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, if they're a general dentist, they wouldn't... I mean, doesn't everybody need a dentist? So if they were going to, if you were a general dentist in Maricopa, would you just upload all of Maricopa? I mean, you wouldn't care if they're homeowners or renter or had kids or not. If you're a general dentist, would you just upload all the people of Maricopa yeah, so on your Facebook? If you were going to do it as a general dentist in a small town, you could do Facebook ads to the entire town because there's not that many in Maricopa. It's probably 40, 50,000. Yeah. And then you could do an every door direct mail campaign if everybody's your target demographic and just mail to every single person. So again, if you don't have a target demographic, you can just do everybody. If but would you say that general dentists really don't have a target? I mean, I could see periodontists wanting implants. I could yeah. see them wanting older people. Exactly, yeah. Um, or meth heads in Apache Junction. I think I, <laughs> uh, uh, why does everybody in the Valley always accuse Apache Junction of all meth? Is it true or false? I've heard it, but I don't know. Well, I actually, I actually <laughs> asked several of my police officers, he says, God dang it, he said, I've had more police officers in my practice tell me that there is not a trailer park in Apache Junction that doesn't have a meth lab. <laughs> so, uh, true. so, so, so periodontists and oral surgeons would want, I, I can see periodontists wanting older people for implants. I can see oral surgeons wanting your ortho market for wisdom teeth. Yeah. Um, and older people. But general dentists, would you say, would you advise the general dentist that everybody needs a dentist, whether they own or rent or what their income? You may. Or, or have you seen a marketing that there is an income minimum floor before you're really getting your teeth cleaned every six so months. So probably to be most effective, if you try to be everything to everyone, you're nothing to no one. So you probably want to choose like, do I want to go after young families and create a message and a marketing message and target them? If you want to do more, you know, implants in your practice, you might go after that. Or if you just want to have like homeowners with higher incomes, you might go after those. You know what my sweet spot love was for 31 years? Um, you drove by my practice just to get here. It's, um, you know, every all these general dentists, they want that really nice lady, Mrs. Wimpleton, who brushes and flosses every morning and every night and comes in every six months for a cleaning, doesn't have any plaque. I don't make anybody on that. <laughs> my biggest cash cow for 25 years, someone comes in with a toothache and needs a $2,500 root canal build up and crown and you do the whole thing in two hours. Um, I mean, that's, um, I mean, when you're talking about these Invisalign cases, $2,500 smile scan or smiles direct club, they gotta see them. Do, do they have to see the patient? They, they, they mail them their liner so they never see them. So they never see them again. Yeah, uh, that, yeah that, that's proper, but um, I, that, that's why I don't, um, you know, everybody needs a dentist, but I really had a moral conflict because from the earliest day I realized I just wanna have emergency dental. I don't want all the overhead and the hygiene and all that stuff. I just want to yeah. do emergency stuff. And then when they're stabilized, a broken tooth needed crown, tooth they needed working on the crown, pull out an impact. That was the cash cow. But then back to treat other people like you want to be treated. And I had these four baby boys. And it's like, well, I didn't want to grow up in a society where everybody just treated it when they had a disaster. Prevented it. That's why I worked on water fluoridation. Um, when I first got here and got the Arizona Award from the Arizona State Dental Society for water fluoridation efforts in Phoenix and had this big old recall, but the cash, the net income, um, is always the, the, the worst dental patient. The best dental patient doesn't need anything. Yeah. I mean, I just had my cleaning last week. I, I haven't needed anything in a decade or two. So I really like it. So the general dentist, I'm, I, I, you want that hillbilly farmer, you know, that hasn't brushed or flossed since teeth in five years and needs four quads root plane, curatage, extractions, implants, root canals, that's where the money is. Um, so so how does uh, the orthodontist listen to this? We'll post this on Orthotown. Mm -hmm. um, how does the orthodontist uh, get involved with you? So they can check us out at orthomarketingdfy.com. That's our website. And so there's a phone number, email, there you can request to have a call with us. It's free just to chat to see if this is a good fit, if it makes sense to you know, implement this in your practice. 
I see you have um, Dr. Burleson on your... Uh, yeah, so we... And he's been on the podcast show. Yeah, we started out as clients of his, and a lot of the strategies we kind of learned from him, and then his thing is he's always provided ideas. He never implemented them. And so a lot of our early clients were clients of his that couldn't figure out how to actually get things done. And so we would just then go on and do it for clients. And then since then, probably like 30% of our clients are working with Dustin Burleson. Most of them are not now. And so we've kind of taken those same strategies and ideas. And made so is them. he uh, happy about that or is he still your buddy or? Yeah, I mean, we still work. I mean, 30% of our clients are still mutual clients with him. And, and so what does he do differently than you? What, what does he do for Orthodox and what do you do for him? So he's a coach and consultant. He gives ideas and tells you how to do it. He doesn't do it for you. Ours okay. is done for you, meaning that all those marketing ideas that you don't, if you don't know Facebook, if you don't know direct mail, if you don't know how to get a mailing list and do all that stuff I just talked about, you just say, do that for us and we'll get it done. And, and, and how many orthodontists are working for you? You're working with us. About 100? About 100, yeah. And how many of those guys understand, could, could just leave you and do it themselves, and really understand at the level you do with 25 employees? Um, Zero. None. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... And, and it's, it's, so, <laughs> it's so... I mean, I love dentists. I do. I mean, um, every time I go out for dinner or to a party or whatever, it, it's only that. I, I love my homies. <laughs> like, God dang it, the, um, if I have to throw you under a bus for one thing, it's like, I, I had a dentist crying because he was in a, a strip center, and the flood started, um, um, dripping into his deal, and so the yoga shop next door, when they found out they, it was a triple net, and they had to pay for this thing, and then when the yoga studio got the bill, they just folded, there was some girl's hobby, she had another job, and this guy um, literally has to pay for like this 15,000 square foot center's roof, even though he rents. And I'm like, well, I, I would sue the real estate attorney who reviewed the lease for you. Who, who, which lawyer did this? Oh, I, I didn't show it to a lawyer. Oh, really? So in eight years of dentistry, did you have like lease 101? I was like, it's like they just don't get help. And, and same thing with return on investments. They always want to ask, anytime you run into a dentist, they want to ask you a clinical question or a clinical technology, CAD CAM, CBCT. And I told them for 31 years, the number one investment you can get is a dental office consultant. And then you talk to the dental office consultants, and they say the only people that come to us, they're already doing over a million a year. I, I talked to a dental consultant on this Saturday, <laughs> on, and her average new uh, client this year was collecting a one and a half million dollars. And then you got all these people doing seven fifty, and they're they're too smart for consultants. Like I, I, I can do my own advertising, I can do my consulting. I, I'm a doctor, damn it! Here's my degree. <laughs> Look at my degree. Is that right there? A doctor of everything. <laughs> and it's like they don't know marketing. They don't know real estate leases. They don't know. They don't know any of that stuff. And the smart ones are humble like me. I've always raised my hand and said, "Gosh." There's got to be with 8 billion people on the planet. Someone's got to know more than me about this. And then, so, so the orthodontists, there's 10,800 orthodontists that we mail Orthotown Magazine to. And half of them are on the website. Why do you think you only got 100 out of 10,000? Of those 10,800, how many of them would benefit from your service? I mean, anyone who wants more patience. So... If you have all the patients you want, then maybe you don't need us. And and if only five percent of orthodontists, of, of only five percent of Americans are going to the orthodontist, the upside in this market. Because when I saw um, the found the CEO of the of the Lion Tech, which owns the Bizline Nitero, Joe Joe Hogan, Joe Hogan, um, who I've asked to come on the show every time I talk to orthodontists, I say get him on the show. Come on, he's on um, Kramer. He, that's another I'm same age bald I mean, I mean I'm, just, I'm, I'm a mini Kramer for dentistry <clears throat> when he's talking to Wall Street the upside on the ortho market is just crazy I mean even if America went from 5% getting to orthodontics to just 10% that's a double and the yeah. orthodontists don't want to look at the upside. They want to look. They want to get all negative. The glass is half empty and blame it on Invisalign and Smiles Direct and the general dentist down the street that did one ortho case three months ago. Right. Uh, I, I have general dentists. I have general dentists that tell me that they did a an ortho course 
They became an Invisalign provider, and now when they go to their study club, their the orthodontists in their town won't even talk to them. <laughs> what, what do you think about that? So we, I mean, have, well, we, have, a little, we have a little different perspective of that, but uh, what we've done is we've reached out to the dentists in our market, and I think it's good when they do Invisalign because then they have eyes for orthodontics. They're looking at teeth that, that are crooked and need to be straightened, and what a lot of times happens is I'll call these dentists up like, hey, how can you ever send patients? And it's not, it, they just never, they never look for orthodontics. Right. That's a part of the thing. So at least when they're Invisalign certified, they're thinking about it. And then I go to them and just say, hey, do you ever need, if you need help on a clean check, call me. I'll help you. Like, I offer to help them to do an Invisalign case. And um, in 13 years, I've had about two people that have actually taken me up on the offer to, to help them. And it's the same thing. They're experts already. You know, they're doctors, so they don't need my help. And where where are you going to get in trouble on an ortho case? I mean, not a lot of um, to tell tell them the cases because sometimes they're young. They got four hundred thousand dollars in student loans. They really want to get into this, and their patient selection is is their their worst their worst deal. What what would you tell them just to not try this case if it was? <laughs> yeah, I mean. Stick with class one mild crowding. The same people that are good candidates for Smile Direct Club would be good candidates for Invisalign. That's one that you could slap Invisalign on and it's hard to screw up. So you're saying class one mild crowding. Now, would you, you really only need a panel with Seth if it's a growing adult. I mean, once you're not growing anymore, you're not trying to predict the future, but um, would you want, uh, would you say adult, non growing, they're already grown? Yeah, so someone that, you know, older teen would probably be fine too. Like, they're not going to change ortho much. Ortho relapse, I think, is another slide. So, so, so I, you would say adult ortho, yeah. non-growing, yeah, relapse class patients. one. Yeah. And what would be, what would be the nightmare? Long um, face. Yeah, I mean. Open bite tendency. Open bites. If you try to do deep bites with Invisalign, those are extremely difficult. They're a lot harder than they look. Then class two, class threes, they're just the mechanics are. Do you even like doing patients with, I mean, if, when you see I someone could, with a class three, I mean, do you even want the case? <laughs> if I could do all class one mild crowding, I'd, that'd be like. Right. For, for, for <laughs> but I mean, do you like class three patients yourself? I mean, when it's got some it's, patient comes in the class three, you're like, ah, this is a cool <laughs> challenge, or you're like, oh, brother. I like being able to help them out, but I know that I have my work cut out for me. It's yeah, we, we be, know that, that those are the ones we don't make any money on. Right? Yeah. Because it takes so if, long. If Northern Odyssey doesn't make money treating hard cases. It's, it's, it's like it's like endo. <laughs> it's like endo. You talk to any of the endodontists around town, they don't get any one canal incisors and canines. I mean, those right. are so profitable. But a retreat on a on a on a molar that operated three canals that missed a canal. I mean, the endodontist. They don't want to treat. Either. They they don't want to treat. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that that's why the endodontist is funny because. They love the ones that send them the virgin molars that need initial ortho, uh, initial endo. And that's, you know, like 20% of the referrals is like 80% of their business. Mm -hmm. And then the other 80% of the referrals is a nonprofit retreat, some messed up ledged canal, you know, just yeah, a like night mile broken off. In yeah, and they're in there with a microscope. Yeah, they, they don't even like that. Um, so, yeah, there is a sweet spot in ortho, but um, There's, it's the just same do for adult ortho, crowding. Yeah. I mean, the ones that take us a long time, we don't make money on, but we do it because we're specialists and because someone has to take care of the patient. But those are not the ones that we make money on that no, you know, someone that's not doing this every day shouldn't even attend. And what about these technologies you're hearing about? There's some uh, vibration technologies. What are those? Yeah. I mean, the jury's kind of still out. What, what's the names of those? Kind of Excelident. 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 And that's a vibrating the tray to seat. Yeah. yeah. To propel. And Propel is the same thing? It has vibration, but it also has, um, so it's like mini osteo perforations. So Propel is the, the drill and the micro perforations. Yeah. Are you doing any of that? Done a little bit. Yeah, but you don't really see. So kind of. Is the main variable to speed instead of changing out, um, changing out the trays once a month to changing them out every two weeks? For Invisalign? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I think there is a little bit of a difference, but to us, it, we can't generate enough um, extra revenue to cover the cost of it so it doesn't doesn't make it work. So you're only flipping trades once a month? We do them once a week. We do them weekly. Invisalign you standard protocols you, once a week. So so when did the protocol go to, um, once a month to once a week? 
It used to be once every two weeks, and then probably about a year ago they went to once a week. So they're gonna send, so is Smiles Direct Club gonna send the patient a tray every week? They send them the whole box they of trays. Them two weeks at a time, and they get all their trays at once. And how many trays are there? I think it's up to twenty or something like that. So they send them twenty trays all at once. Mm-hmm. And do you do you think this is gonna happen? What do you think this is a, a solid strategy? I mean, if they're half price, what do you guys charge for a design? What, what, what's, your, case. Yeah, what, what, what's your standard? It's like 5,800, 6,200, something like that. 58 to 62? Yeah. So we'll just say 6,000. Yeah. And then you said the Smiles Direct was... Uh, 2,500. 2,500. So they're less than half. So do you think, you know, price elasticity? I mean, obviously you sell more, you sell hardly any Cadillacs, and then as you lower the price to Buicks, you sell more, you lower it to Old, you sell more the Chevys you sell the most, do you think that they're going to really expand by dropping the price point in half? Do you see this? They have no doctor overhead, so that's where they can make all their money. They don't pay a doctor to be in the facility, and then the patient has to return. And so they've cut all the expensive parts of dentistry out of the equation. But but, but it's the business model. They're going to do an IPO this year. Uh, I'm not gonna. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm gonna invest. I'm asking for a friend. I'm asking for Buster. Buster wants to know. Um, yeah. Do you think this is a rock solid business model? I mean, do you yes. think? Yes. They they're they outspend it. they outspend Invisalign on marketing, and they're a billion dollar company already. Like it's. Well, it's a billion dollar company, but but I don't know if they're profitable. Yeah, and there's no. <laughs> it's like Uber. You know, and this is another thing about great about being able like when Uber came out and they were saying they were worth a gazillion billion dollars, I think that they first jumped to what it was worth like eighty billion. It's like, dude, I saw this with hotels.com. Well, where's your protective moat? I guarantee you that someday when when hotels.com came out, you know, they were everything. But now how how many travel sites are there on the internet? Right? Yeah, it's still and stuff. So now you already have Lyft. Lyft came out and they already got a quarter of the market. Mm-hmm. And I bet you anything, in 10 years now, you'll have an app that will feed into all the ride-sharing things. And you can say, well, there's an Uber car 10 minutes away and a Lyft car 5 minutes away and your cousin Eddie, you know, that's doing it by himself. I, I don't see the protective barrier. I don't see the patents. There's already the protective modes. about six different companies doing the direct-to-consumer liners. So Really? Yeah, there's already tons there's of people much jumping much into it. Can, Smell you, can you email me that list? Yeah. Do you know you know them off the top of your head? There's Candid is okay. probably the next biggest one. Oh, I got that one. Then okay. Smile Love, I think, is... Candid, Smile Love. Love. Or is it Smile Co? And then... Smile Co, right? Yeah, and then there's everybody else. Those Smile Direct's the biggest, Candid's number two, and then there's probably like four other copycats that... I see them on so, my face. So Rogan and Align Tech are in lawsuits with Smiles Direct, but they own 19%. It's going to be an IPO. That's yep. it's kind of a weird yeah. <laughs> relationship. I think they'll have a nasty divorce or they're trying to have one already. So that'll they'll part ways. I think initially Smile Direct Club wanted to kind of partner with them, thinking that they would eventually sell out to Invisalign, but then they quickly figured out they had something that had some legs on it. Now they've since wanted to do their own thing, so. Yeah, and then who? And then the, wasn't the technology originally invented by a guy from Pakistan who moved to Dallas? For Invisalign, for yeah. He was in Bay Area, I think, originally. But then he, when he when he left he left Invisalign. That's when he started the OrthoClear. Is it OrthoClear? OrthoClear, and then Invisalign sued them and put them out of business, and then and then someone started ClearCorrect. After that, was he behind Clear Correct? I know he was behind Ortho Clear, but I don't know who was Clear Correct. Because didn't a lot of their patents just go? Yeah, everything everything expired in I think in December of last year. So at the AAO meeting this year, there was about thirty companies now doing aligners. Even Henry Shine's getting Henry Shine's doing yeah. it. Three M's doing it. Ormco has them. I mean, everybody. So so then back to the. Um, Back to the stock and the company now that the all the patents are expired and 30 new players are under. Do you see anybody with a protective moat? I think being the first in the industry always gives you a huge competitive advantage. And so I think Invisalign is going to be the first and the best for the foreseeable future. And Smile Direct Club already has that in the direct-to-consumer model. And so I don't think anyone's going to 
be able to match them. I mean, they've already expanded to hundreds of smile centers or all over the nation. So I want so, you to I want you to cut your own throat. Um, I'm going to give you the rope, and then you hang yourself. Um, we have two dental schools up the street from us. You're faculty at AT still. Um, dental school. The kid comes out four hundred thousand dollars in general dentistry. I mean, four hundred thousand dollars in student loans. You you know these kids. Yeah, they're uh, they started their practice. Yeah, <laughs> would you recommend that a general dentist learn um, implants or Invisalign for their practice? Depends on where they are, but Mesa, Tempe, Chil- the, the yeah. <laughs> Tempe, Chandler, and Gilbert, Mesa, Awatuki. I think that. Um... The, the one thing about, like, if you were to differentiate the two with implants or oral surgery or something like that, if it's not working out for you, you can shut it down. If you're doing, if you get into orthodontics, like we've been talking about that, working out of the GP's office, you still got a two year commitment to get right. to finish all those right. cases. So I, I think from a start and stop standpoint, like, in implants probably makes more sense. Um, it depends on the type of practice you're going to get into. If you like older patients, then implants. Yeah. But, and, and I think. You know, treat treat those treat treat the implant patients. But I think be good or be really good at what you do and figure out what you want. Like that's the advice I give: is figure out what it is you want to be and be really good at that. I think I think and market try that. to be. But they're but they're going thing. they're going the opposite way. I mean, in 1900, healthcare was one percent of the GDP and there were no specialties. By 2000, it was 14 percent of the GDP. The physicians had 58 specialties and dentists had nine. And now it's 2018 and healthcare is 18. So if there's 40,000 healthcare monthly journal magazines, 40,000. And then these dentists, they, they, they want to be a jack of all trades. They go, oh, dude, we're going back to 1900. I'm going to learn implants and Invisalign and sleep apnea and cosmetic and veneers and root canals and bone graft. And it's like, dude, are you out of your mind? I mean, when, when a dentist tells me, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go learn implants. I say, what are you going to give up? Oh, nothing. So, the, I mean, for me, it's totally really hard to stay up on endo. And yeah. then on implants, I mean, look at implants. I got my diplomat in the International Congress of Ontology, my fellowship in the Michigan, hell, just bone grafting you couldn't keep up on. And then they say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to know everything about endo and retreats, and then it is line and ortho, and then I'm going to learn uh, implantology and bone grafting, and then I'm going to learn sleep apnea. It's like, you're 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 going back to 1900. Do you do you really see that 100 years from now that you'll just have a general surgeon at Chandler Memorial Hospital that can just operate on any part of your body, or do you just see it going further, further, further specialized? I think it'll be further specialized. So I mean, the average general dentist, I would say, find out what you're actually passionate about, what you want to really focus on. And get good at that and then figure out a marketing message to attract more of those patients. Because I think there's enough teeth to go around, there's enough business to go around, whatever you want to do. But I don't think you, again, trying to, for marketing, if you try to be everything to everyone, you're nothing to no one. So you should choose one vertical, one demographic that you want to be the best at that. And then make that be your message. Kind of like what you've done with, um, with, um, with your website, um. Well, your ortho marketing DFY, where not only are you just doing marketing, but it's just for orthodontists. Yeah. I so, mean, yeah. are you doing any, are you offering your services to pediatric dentists and endodontists and general dentists, or, or do you just really want to focus on orthodontists? So, all of our clients are orthodontists. There's a handful of dentists who do ortho in their practice that use us. But that's really like, we have a system that we know works for gathering you know, direct to consumer to get orthodontic patients. And so that's our model. And so we can do that really well. If we try to do, you know, implants here, then wisdom teeth here, and root canals here, we probably wouldn't be very good at any of them. So we decided to be one thing really, really good at that and choose our niche. So that's why they say there's riches and niches with marketing. Because if you get really good at one vertical then that's scalable and that's really profitable. I think it's the same thing in any business that if you try to be everything, it's hard to be profitable in that one, in all things. But you can get profitable in one thing if that's what So how much does it cost in orthodontist to join your program? So there's a couple different packages to get like the entire done-for-you service where we're on Facebook, you know, 
internal marketing, external marketing, social media marketing, direct mail, everything. It's about twenty nine ninety seven per month for like a full comprehensive service. There are some people that choose little bits and pieces of that and we can unbundle based on that. But we always like to say if we get you one patient a month, you break even. Everyone after that is pure profit, so. Right. That's the nice thing about orthodontics is we have really big profit margins. Each patient is worth a lot, so. You know, if we do a thousand things and get success with only 10% of them, we still made a whole lot of money. So, so on your marketing, back there, we talked about orthodontics. Centers. By the way, you, get, you said you gave me an hour and I'm well ago. We're talking. Are you guys okay Sorry. or do you need to run? No, no we're good. You're good. Um, <laughs> does that $29.97, but does that, that plus the cost of like, say we're going to do a direct mail campaign, that $29.97 would include the printing of the postcard right. and mailing it. The- so we try to look at it as if you were to do this yourself, you're going to have the cost of the direct mail, the Facebook ads, all those costs. Plus you're going to have to hire an employee. We're basically your employee and we cost less than a full-time employee would. So, so that 2997 is for that employee. That's, that's our but management. They, they still got to pay for yeah. Yeah, the printing all this stuff. and the postage and the ads on Facebook and all that kind of but stuff. But because you use us, we get quantity discounts on like the print and postage. We can get it cheaper than anyone else. Is that so, is that in town here? It's actually in um, Kansas. Kansas. We found it. That's where I was born and raised. Wichita, Kansas. It's actually in Wichita. So. No way. Yeah, there's a print and post house that we get. Will you email rates. me? Will you email me the name of it? Yeah. Because I I, I mail a hundred page magazine. Yeah, to guarantee you can save a ton of money on. To one hundred twenty-five thousand that is everyone, and then at ten thousand orthodontists get the orthodontic magazine. So the mail house across the street, so they walk across the street and they save you on the postage and everything too. Yeah, so. my my printing bill is seventy thousand a month. My postage is seventy thousand a month, and my paper is seventy thousand a month. So I, I I have two. I have a quarter million dollars a month overhead just on printing, postage, paper. Yeah. Uh, labels, <laughs> it's, it's 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 crazy. Um, and of your hundred orthodontists, how many do you think they? How many? What is your average? What, what do you think the average orthodontist? How many clients he gets a month from being on the service? Um, if they're doing one, one to break even, and yeah, I mean, it really depends on the size of their geographic area. So bigger practices with a bigger footprint will get more, but like with some clients, they hit gold. Like one client did one of our system where they go and text blast all their no sell list and she got 31 patients like in a week. And so that was every once in a while we'll get like insane numbers like that. We haven't had anyone get less than like five in a month. Okay. Back to do demographics matter. Um, it, you're in a highly competitive army. Yeah. I mean, I, if you guys don't know Gilbert Chandler, I mean, you could throw a cat and not hit a dentist, a pediatrician. I mean, there's just so much. Um, if some kid was coming out of AT still, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, would you say do demographics matter? Go out oh, yeah. to Eloy? I'd say go to Montana. <laughs> yeah. South, South, South. So if you look at the map, there are certain areas of the country where we have no clients. Those are all the areas that they should go because everywhere it's competitive. That's where everybody needs our services. And so, so where East, were... East West Coast, Texas, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, we have a lot of clients. So say it again. So East Coast, West Coast, you know, Florida. For sure, Texas, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Vegas as well. It's crowded. Yep, Denver. Oh yeah, Colorado. So, demographics. What would you What would you tell graduates? Go somewhere where not everyone wants to live. So, you know, Midwest, you know, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota. We don't have any clients in those areas because they've got enough patients simply by, you know, supply and demand. So if you want to do well without having a market, you should go to one of those areas. If you want to live in, you know, Southern California, you should prepare to be very invested in marketing. And here's where it's going to take you. Here, here's what I can tell you just in a nutshell. If it takes you, <coughs> the number one airline in the United States is Southwest Airlines, or 27% of all passengers see miles from Southwest Airlines. If it takes you once you're two hours away from an airport that has Southwest Airlines, the dentist's office is doing a million and their overhead's 50%. And if you can see the damn coast or the ocean or the airport from your office, yeah, you, you're going to be struggling. And it sounds so bad. You say, well, I just don't want to live there. Dude, we are, we're in ground zero for Google. As owned by Alphabet owns Google. They own way most of the driverless cars. 
I've seen all these driverless cars. The test market was here. They did the one-year test, and did you know the test was over like six months ago, and Google ordered 60,000 more cars? So what it's going to be like, you can live wherever you want, and you're going to be at work at 8, you're just going to, your alarm clock's going to go off at 6, and you're just going to go walk out into a driverless box and go back to bed, and it's going to automatically drive you two hours out in the middle of nowhere, and then you'll be at work, and then you can get up, and then you go work, uh, I, I tell them, just do this, do four tens. Go, go practice Monday through Thursday, four 10 hour days, and then get back in your driverless car, and then go live like a rich rock star Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I know dentists in Bakersfield that make so much money on four tens, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that then they jump in their black Porsche, or their single prop or double prop airplane, fly back into Orange County, and then have a million dollar condo overlooking the ocean, live like a rock star. And I can't say their names because it might be, they just say his name is Chip Castain, class of 87, <laughs> University of Missouri, Kansas City. And it's like they work and make mint where they're needed. Yep. And then they, it's like Dennis will say to me, they're coming out, well, I just want to live in Scottsdale. Dude, opening up in Scottsdale, I would advise uh, probably a better decision to get addicted to weed, uh, become an alcoholic. <laughs> I mean, I can think of like five better decisions. Um, it's like, well, why don't you live in Scottsdale and commute out to Eloy, which still doesn't have dentists. You, do you know a guy, you know a guy named Jared Pope? Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the earliest guys that was me, he came to me as a kid, he came out of school and everything. I said, dude, there's not a dentist in Maricopa. Don't even look. I said, where are you living? He was like Chandler or Gilbert. Or I said, don't, don't even, this is where you live. But you open out there. If, when I told him that, Florence didn't have a dentist. Maricopa didn't have a dentist. He, he went out there and just, it was just like shooting fish in a barrel. And, and then when you drive from Phoenix to LA, when you get to the Arizona line on 10, the Arizona California, what's that city there? Blythe. Blythe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you know Blythe doesn't have a dentist? <laughs> Did you know that? I didn't. I mean, Blythe doesn't have a dentist. And how long of a commute would it be from Scottsdale to Blythe? Probably two and a half hours. Yeah, so why don't you go live in Blythe in some little apartment and work four 10-hour days and then get in your black Porsche and drive back three and a half hours and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you can live in the richest house in Scottsdale and live like a rock star. They just, they just don't get the demographic. And if you say demographics don't matter, what you should do, open your practice in the Congo or Afghanistan, and uh, <laughs> practice in Afghanistan for three years, and then call me up and say, yeah, demographics don't matter. I'm crushing it in Afghanistan. <laughs> I've got branch offices in the Congo, and uh, I'm opening up another one in Tanzania, and, uh, and go to Venezuela. It's even closer. Demographics don't matter. Go to Venezuela where the United Nations says five million of their 50 million people have already left the country because the whole society has collapsed. Yeah, go there. <laughs> maybe after a year in Venezuela, you'll say, maybe the country matters. Maybe the economic system matters. Maybe demographics matter. And, uh, but uh, you guys, uh, so what's your final? What, what did I, was I not smart enough to ask you that you should have talked about to my homies? Um, I, I think one thing, too, if, you, if this is going on north of town, even downtown, that to, to the young guys is, <clears throat> I would just, realize that stuff doesn't matter too. What I'm, what I'm talking about is like gadgets and gizmos and comb beams and scanners and whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll have people that'll say, I'm opening my new practice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a scanner. Which one should I get? I'm like, don't get a scanner. You know, I, I, they, they think that, 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 that um, this, this special piece of equipment is going to bring them all the patients in the world. And I think you have to justify the cost of whatever it is that you're buying. And that's why a lot of like the accelerants and the propels and whatever, orthodontically speaking, even Invisalign. Like if I was this new startup and I didn't have any money, I wouldn't do Invisalign. I can't afford a lab bill. I think you got to be smart. What with would you start with? with? Cheapest what, brackets the, the available. Dollar, dollar, dollar brackets that you can get, you know, cheapest dollar brackets. Which brand, which one would that be? I don't know. There's a lot of different Get them brands. off eBay for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I mean, the 3M reference went out, so I've been using him for gum yeah. for 31 years. It's like $19. I sent it to the lab up the street, Van Hook or, or Glidewell, that makes a, a zirconia crown for 99 
And they come in, oh, you should get a scanner. <laughs> How much is it? 17000 Really? Seven, so $17,000 to replace my $17 impression? Yeah, and then you have to have a, a software agreement that's 200 a month. <laughs> Dude, I wasn't even buying two hundred a month at Invergo. I mean, I mean, I mean and, and and the dentist is jumping the stuff, and it's a dentist thing because when you go to lunch with a physician, and I recommend network. I mean, I'm in all the last year. I've had lunch or deals with almost with almost every chiropractor, every naturopath, any, any re referral, you know, anything like that. And they never talk about technology. You go meet with a physician, and I say, oh yeah, I just bought a seventeen thousand dollar ultrasound machine, and I just bought. It. Only dentists, <laughs> chiropractors don't, vets don't, physicians don't, MDs don't. I've never had lunch or dinner with an MD who talked about a high dollar technology purchase he bought. And then you go talk to dentists and it's all they want to talk about. It's like, it's like, it's a, yeah. it's a dental obsession. I'm like, well, instead of the $17,000 3M True Def scanner, why don't you use the 3M's Empergum? which they got when they bought SB from Germany, which, I mean, a poly, I mean, yeah, just, it's not what you earn, it's what you burn. And some of the million dollar practices, the dentist takes home 100,000 a year, and in some of the $400,000 practices, the dentist takes home 200,000 a year. So did you go to school eight years so that you can buy all this high tech stuff, or did you want to pay back your student loans and make bank? Yeah. <laughs> so anything else I wouldn't swear to talk about? Um, I think, Biggest thing is orthodontics and probably dentistry in general is changing. You need to pr approach it like a business person, not like a doctor, which means you need to invest in marketing. You need to figure out how to be profitable. And it's not all about, I'm a doctor, I'm entitled to make money. It's what do I need to do inside of this new you know, business that I'm in to make money? Because ultimately, like I said, if you have student loans, if you have debts, if you have all these things, your goal is to provide a good service, but also to earn an income. And so it needs to be approached differently. So that's why marketing is a big thing where you have to invest in it, especially based on where you're at, if you want to be successful and continue providing the service. And another way to cut your overhead, we always talk about not buying high tech, buying in for God, not a true deaf scanner, all these scanners. Remember, uh, don't get married because then you won't get divorced. No <laughs> alimony. Don't have kids and you want to put them through college. So if you stay single, you'll never get divorced. And if you don't have kids, you'll never have to put anyone through college. So if you just don't get married, don't have kids, and don't buy money. That's what you're saying? Don't get married, don't have kids, and don't buy high technologies. You heard it? You heard it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was uh, funny. Uh, it, it, I can't tell you what honor it was at the two biggest ortho fish in Arizona to road in my house. Were you scared when you drove into Phoenix? I mean, I'm in Phoenix. You guys are in Gilbert. Uh, did you pack a weapon when you drove into Phoenix to come to my house? It's a little sketchy. It's a little, little sketchy. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> man, thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you. Thank you.